The Necklace by Guy de Maupassant. She was one of those pretty charming young ladies born as if through an error of destiny into a family of clerks. She had no dowry, no hopes, no means of becoming known, appreciated, loved, and married by a man either rich or distinguished, and she allowed herself to marry a petty clerk in the office of the Board of Education. She was simple, not being able to adorn herself, but she was unhappy, as one out of her class, for women belonged to no caste, no race, their grace, their beauty, and their charm serving them in the place of birth and family. Their inborn finesse, their instinctive elegance, their suppleness of wit, are their only aristocracy making some daughters of the people the equal of great ladies. She suffered incessantly, feeling herself born for all delicacies and luxuries. She suffered from the poverty of her apartment, the shabby walls, the worn chairs, and the faded stuffs. All these things, which another woman of her station would not have noticed, tortured and angered her. The sight of the little Breton, who made this humble home, awoke in her sad regrets and desperate dreams. She thought of quiet antechambers with their oriental hangings lighted by high bronze torches, and of the two great footmen in short trousers who sleep in the large armchairs made sleepy by the heavy air from the heating apparatus. She thought of large drawing rooms hung in old silks, of graceful pieces of furniture carrying bric-a-brac of inestimable value, and of the little perfumed coquettish apartments made for five o'clock chats with most intimate friends, men known and sought after, whose attention all women envied and desired. When she seated herself for dinner before the round table where the tablecloth had been used three days, opposite her husband, who uncovered the tureen with a delighted air, saying, Oh, the good pot pie! I know nothing better than that! She would think of the elegant dinners, of the shining silver, of the tapestries peopling the walls with ancient personages and rare birds in the midst of fairy forests. She thought of the exquisite food served on marvelous dishes, of the whispered gallantries listened to with the smile of the sphinx while eating the rose-colored flesh of the trout or a chicken's wing. She had neither frocks nor jewels, nothing, and she loved only those things. She felt that she was made for them. She had such a desire to please, to be sought after, to be clever and courted. She had a rich friend, a schoolmate at the convent, whom she did not like to visit. She suffered so much when she returned, and she wept for whole days from chagrin, from regret, from despair and disappointment. One evening, her husband returned, elated, bearing in his hand a large envelope. Here, he said, here is something for you. She quickly tore open the wrapper and drew out a printed card on which were inscribed these words. The Minister of Public Instruction and Madame Georges Ramponneau asked the honor of Monsieur and Madame Loisel's company Monday evening, January 18, at the minister's residence. Instead of being delighted, as her husband had hoped, she threw the invitation spitefully upon the table, murmuring, What do you suppose I want with that? Uh, uh, but, my dearie, I, I thought it would make you happy. You never go out, and this is an occasion, and a fine one. I had a great deal of trouble to get it. Everybody wishes one, and it's very select. Not many are given to employees. You'll see the whole official world there. She looked at him with an irritated eye and declared impatiently, What do you suppose I have to wear to such a thing as that? He had not thought of that. He stammered, Uh, what? Why, the dress you wear when we go to the theater, it, it seems very pretty to me. He was silent, stupefied, in dismay at the sight of his wife weeping. Two great tears fell slowly from the corners of her eyes toward the corners of her mouth. He stammered, What's the matter? What is the matter? By a violent effort, she had controlled her vexation and responded in a calm voice, wiping her moist cheeks. Nothing. Only I have no dress, and consequently I cannot go to this affair. Give your card to some colleague whose wife is better filled out than I. He was grieved, but answered, Let us see, Matilda. How much would a suitable costume cost, something that would serve for other occasions, something very simple? She reflected for some seconds, making estimates and thinking of a sum that she could ask for without bringing with it an immediate refusal and a frightened exclamation from the economical clerk. Finally, she said in a hesitating voice, I cannot tell exactly, but it seems to me that 400 francs ought to cover it. 
he turned a little pale, for he had saved just this sum to buy a gun, that he might be able to join some hunting parties the next summer, on the plains at Nanterre, with some friends who went to shoot larks up there on Sunday. Nevertheless, he answered, Very well, I will give you the four hundred francs, but try to have a pretty dress. The day of the ball approached, and Madame Loisel seemed sad, disturbed, anxious. Nevertheless, her dress was nearly ready. Her husband said to her one evening, What's the matter with you? You've acted strangely for two or three days. And she responded, I am vexed not to have a jewel, not one stone, nothing to adorn myself with. I shall have such a poverty-laden look. I would prefer not to go to this party. He replied, You can wear some natural flowers. At this season, they look very chic. For ten francs, you can have two or three magnificent roses. She was not convinced. No, she replied. There is nothing more humiliating than to have a shabby air in the midst of rich women. Then her husband cried out, How stupid we are! Go and find your friend, Madame Forestier, and ask her to lend you her jewels. You're well enough acquainted with her to do this. She uttered a cry of joy. It's true, she said. I hadn't thought of that. The next day she took herself to her friend's house and related her story of distress. Madame Forestier went to her closet with the glass doors, took out a large jewel case, brought it, opened it, and said, Choose, my dear. She saw at first some bracelets, then a collar of pearls, then a Venetian cross of gold and jewels and of admirable workmanship. She tried the jewels before the glass, hesitated, but could neither decide to take them nor leave them. Then she asked, Have you nothing more? Why, yes, look for yourself. I don't know what will please you. Suddenly she discovered in a black satin box a superb uh, necklace of diamonds, and her heart beat fast with an immoderate desire. Her hands trembled as she took them up. She placed them about her throat, against her dress, and remained in ecstasy before them. Then she asked, in a hesitating voice, full of anxiety, Could you lend me this? Only this. Why, yes, certainly. She fell upon the neck of her friend, embraced her with passion, and then went away with her treasure.